want to welcome you this morning and you who, those of you who are listening on the radio we are grateful that you have joined us on this Sunday morning for our time of Bible study you're listening to let the Bible speak and uh, we're going to be looking today in Matthew chapter 27 as we continue to, to study the trial of Jesus uh, before we get to that we're going to have a prayer on our prayer list, let's remember George Trent. George is recuperating from kidney surgery, and uh, and so he is having kind of a hard time with that, I understand. So let's, let's remember him in prayer. Also, I talked to uh, Larry Tucker yesterday, and Larry's having some health issues, so let's put him on our prayer list as well, and remembering him prayer in prayer as he is uh, uh, looking at some... Uh, further testing and so on and so forth this coming week. Um, on our prayer list as well, let's remember Miss Melinda Brandon. Did she get moved, Mary Lou? Still here? Uh, so she's... Huh? All right. Uh, she is still here in the Macon County General Hospital, so let's remember that. Uh <clears throat> And then we have uh, several more on our prayer list, and I won't go through all these, but let's uh, let's not forget them as well. Anybody else you know of you'd like for us to remember in prayer this morning? Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, you know, we had a big debate about what kind of surgery he was having Wednesday night, you know. And uh, come to find out, both uh, both reports are right, correct. Uh, he uh, did have kidney surgery, and he's going to have prostate surgery. So <laughs> uh, we we will we will continue to remember him. Of course, Miss Betty Wilkerson. Miss Betty is in the Sumner uh, Regional Hospital. And she's not doing very well. She's battled cancer now for several years. And uh, she is uh, kind of in a weakened state because of all her treatments that she's having. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Philip. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, Miss Nastia Fry. Um, so she's going to be having uh, surgery. That's pretty intensive. Anybody else? All right, will you bow with me, please? Our Father, we're thankful this morning as we uh, begin in our class. We come in this prayer as we always do, yet we know that you already know our needs even before we ask, and yet we come because we know that uh, you have taught us and you've commanded us to ask what we will. And so we come to pray for those that are sick, and we ask that you would bless them and be with each one. Be with those who have recently undergone surgery and recuperating. We pray for those who are about to go into surgery. We pray that that will be successful for them. We ask that you bless others who are having chronic illness and, and, uh, and poor health. We pray for them. Our Father, we ask today as we come in this prayer that you would bless us in our class, especially as we study your word. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I, I want to just mention something here before I actually get started in our text today. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open it with me to the book of Matthew chapter 27. And then I want you to mark in your Bible uh, another passage uh, that we'll look at as well. That's John chapter 18. So you mark those two passages. As you're turning there, let me remind those maybe who are listening on the radio that you can watch this service on YouTube. You simply just go to YouTube or go to the search site and you can type in Lafayette Church of Christ and it will pull up uh, this uh, live feed. But you can also go back and look at previous uh, lessons that uh, we've done. All of our all of our lessons on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. On Wednesday night, I'm studying with the class in here, the book of Romans. Uh, if you wish to study along with us and yet you can't find it 
uh, convenient to come to uh, the building here, you can uh, follow along with us uh, by way of YouTube on your computer and study with us this wonderful book called the Book of Romans. And I just uh, lay that out there for you and let you uh, uh, know that, and perhaps you can join us at other occasions as well. Now, we're looking here at the section where Jesus has been brought before Pilate. And uh, he is going to be judged by Pilate. Now, in the trial of Jesus, there were uh, two stages or two trials. Let me put it that way. There were two trials, and each of the trials had three phases in them. You have the Jewish trial, and then you have the Roman trial. In the Jewish trial, the three phases were where he was taught, he was taken to to uh, Annas, and then he's taken to Caiaphas, and then he's taken to the Sanhedrin. So those are the three fa phases you have in the Jewish trial of Jesus. In the Roman trial, you're going to have three phases as well. And those three phases are he's taken to Pilate, and then he is sent to Herod. And then from Herod, he's sent back to Pilate again. So there are three phases there. And in all these phases and all these trials, the, the thing that comes out and what the gospel writers are trying to show us is that Jesus is carefully examined. He is, he is scrutinized, he is tried, and yet no one can find any fault with him. Now, you remember, don't you, <clears throat> in your study in past and in Jewish Passover, uh, they always offered a, a Passover lamb. And there was a requirement for that Passover lamb. Do you remember what that requirement was in order for that lamb to qualify as the sacrifice on the Passover? Or it had to be without blemish, had to be without spot. Could be nothing examined on that lamb that you could find fault with. Now remember, this time there's a new Passover lamb. Symbolically, Jesus is that Passover lamb. And so now what we have is an examination taking place at Passover of the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. If fault is found, he disqualifies as the Passover lamb, and our sins are not remitted and forgiven. If he does qualify, if he is someone that they say, uh, and, and the gospel writers bear out, that uh, he has no sin, he has no fault, there is no blemish in him, therefore he qualifies in the eyes of God as the Passover lamb. So that's what's going on here. And in all these uh, uh, phases and all this experience of Jesus, it's all for this purpose to show us how he is indeed the Lamb of God. Now, in verse 11, it tells us that meanwhile Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you king of the Jews? Uh, you have said so, Jesus replied. Now, here's where we were last week. Now, there are three um, phases in this text, three points in this text I want to look at with you. The first point I want to look at is what we're going to call the accusation. That's found in verse 11. Uh, Pilate comes and he asks Jesus this question, or rather he's Jesus is taken to Pilate, and Pilate asks the question, are you king of the Jews? Now the obvious question here is, is why did he ask that particular question? Why was this the question that he deemed to see and to feel was the most important question to ask? And so that's what we're going to look at now. Matthew gives us a section and a, and a composite, not a composite, but he gives us a, a, a view of the trial and the, res, and the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ that some of the other writers don't, and some of the other writers give us a view that Matthew doesn't. Matthew leaves out some things here that are found in some of the other Gospels. Uh, for example, we're going to look in, in um, John chapter 18. And in John 18, <clears throat> you have uh, for us set up by John why Pilate asked this question of Jesus, are you king of the Jews? And so that's where we're going to look at this morning as we think about this uh, about this text here. Now, Pilate knew who Jesus was. 
remember now he's the governor of Judea and he uh, certainly has his hand on the pulse of things that are going on in Jerusalem. I guarantee you he knew all about the triumphal entry that Jesus had made a week earlier or a few days earlier. I guarantee you he knew about Jesus. He knew uh, uh, that uh, you know, he was someone that was significant to the people. He knew that he was a rabbi. He knew he was someone that many of the people respected and saw as someone very important for them in their lives. So he knew all that. Um, it wasn't that Jesus was a complete stranger here to Pilate. Remember now, you remember now when Jesus is arrested in the garden. Roman guards are sent along with the uh, temple guards to arrest Jesus. Remember, we talked about that. All right. Who allowed those Roman guards, or Roman soldiers, I should say, to go with these temple soldiers? It had to be Pilate. Therefore, Pilate must have known who Jesus was, or at least was familiar with him to a certain extent that he would allow these Roman soldiers to be a part of this arrest of Jesus. <clears throat> so we have here now Pilate who uh, asked Jesus this question here. Now, if you're with me, let's look now. Are we there now, Tony? Are you up with me? Okay. I didn't see it on the back screen, so I'll just look around. But in Romans, or rather in John chapter 18 now, John chapter 18 uh, I, what I'm going to try to do is, is pull these different passages together. If you want to mark in your Bible a second passage, you can turn to Luke chapter 23. Uh, we're going to look at that section as well. Now, it says here in John chapter 18, verse 28, Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman, of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. Now, they take Jesus. Uh, he's been at Caiaphas' house, uh, so that's illegal. He can't be tried anywhere except in the judgment hall. Uh, he, he can't be tried legally except during daylight hours. So what they do is, is once he gets through with Caiaphas' house, they convene the Sanhedrin at the judgment court. And, and it's daylight now. It's around 5 o'clock, five, uh, between 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and they have a hurried trial with the Sanhedrin to legalize things. So now they know they can't crucify him. Uh, they know that they don't have the legal authority to put Jesus to death. Now somebody says, well, what about Stephen in Acts chapter 8 where Stephen is stoned? Well, that's a mob. Uh, that was an illegal act. That was not something that was sanctioned by the Roman government. It was, a, it was just a, a mob that you have that, uh, that, that organizes there suddenly at the response of Stephen preaching. In this case, however, the Sanhedrin and the leaders want this to be a legitimate trial, at least uh, on appearance. They want it to be something that they can say to the people, because Jesus is so popular with the people, they want to be able to say to the people, we didn't put him to death, the Romans did. And so that's what they're doing here. They're trying to get the Romans involved in this to kind of wash their hands of it, or at least to give the appearance that, you know, they didn't really have anything to do with that, though they are the, invest uh, the instigators behind all of it. And so they bring Jesus now to Pilate in John chapter 28. And it says to us it was early in the morning, and to avoid from being declared unclean for the ceremony that's about to take place, place with the Passover, they did not enter the house of Pilate because they thought that that would make them unclean. <laughs> now, there's nothing in the Old Testament that said anything like that. There's nothing in the Old Testament that commanded a Jew to refuse to enter the house of some Gentile. Nothing in Scripture about that. That's something that came by rabbinical teaching and superstition. 
and tradition of the Jews. That's what this is. The Jews uh, believed uh, oftentimes, for example, a, a Gentile woman would abort her child. And when she would abort the child, she'd uh, uh, put the child, place the child in the drainage, the house. And that would cause the house to become unclean. And so therefore to enter the Gentile's house would uh, contaminate them. And so this is very hypocritical. You can just see the hypocrisy in all this as what they're doing. And so they refused to go into Pilate's home or to Pilate's court, place where he is. He's probably at Fort Antonio. And uh, while he's there, uh, they bring Jesus. And it says in verse 29, So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? Now, <clears throat> uh, this is all a legal proceeding. Uh, Pilate, apparently Jesus is inside of Pilate's home, uh, court, place, wherever it is. And uh, uh, Pilate comes out to accommodate the Jews here because they won't go into the house. He's on the porch. He's looking down at the Jews. And, uh, and he asks them a question, okay, what's the, uh, what's the charge? Uh, what, what's the accusation you have? And uh, it's all a part of the legal proceeding. Now, the Jews come back with a little bit of a snippy uh, comeback at, uh, at uh, Pilate here. A and they say to him now here, uh, if he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. And so I think Pilate understands that this is probably all a trumped up deal. Uh, like I said, he probably, you know, he's probably w well acquainted with Jesus and all that, and probably also well acquainted with the leader's uh, attitude toward Jesus. And so uh, they kind of snippy uh, at him, and they tell him, well, if he were a criminal, would, would we bring him here? Uh, Dwayne? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Were you here that day I talked about all that? <laughs> okay. Uh, just, uh, it probably did. I don't know. No, I'm just joking. Okay. But but it is a legitimate question that perhaps some some did not uh, uh, hear, uh, were not here, maybe forgotten. Um, Passover um, for Jews um for certain Jews, it was uh, on uh, a different day because of the way they kept time. I, you remember when I told you a couple of weeks ago, uh, when, when the, back in this day there was no such thing as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They counted everything by the Sabbath. That's how they did it. Uh, it was the second day from the Sabbath or three days before the Sabbath. Sabbath was, that's how they kept the day of the weeks. And so you had the Jews in Galilee who kept a different Passover time than the Jews in Judea. The Jews in Judea had a Passover that was actually, I think, 12 hours off the top of my head right now, 12 hours later than the Galilean uh, Jews did. That's why you have Jesus observing the Passover when he did, and then you have this statement made about the uh, Jewish leaders going to observe Passover later. Uh, seems like conflict, but when you read uh, background material, you discover what's going on here. Does that help answer it? You remember that now? Okay. <laughs> I'm the same way. If you get me kick-started, I can remember it, but uh, if I had to call recall, I'm in trouble. So what they do here is that they say to Pilate in kind of an arrogant way, you know, if he wasn't a criminal, you know we wouldn't have brought him to you. So Pilate responds and he says, take him, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Now I don't know if he's saying there that you have to, uh, you, you have my permission to uh, crucify him or to put him to death or not. Now, Jews didn't practice crucifixion, only the Romans did that. Uh, the Jews, how would the Jews have uh, uh, executed somebody? Anybody know off the top of your head? How did Jews execute, huh? Stone. Stoning, that's right. They stoned people. That's, that's how they executed people. 
uh, the Romans, however, they crucified people. Now, you remember Jesus had already said earlier back in Matthew how Jesus predicted that the Son of Man must be lifted up. Well, that's not stoning, that's crucifixion. And so the, in order to fulfill prophecy, fulfill the purpose of God, and plan of God, it had to be done by, by the Romans. And, but anyways, Pilate tells them, said, you just take him. He perceives that this has something to do with their religion and that sort of thing, and that's not something he has a taste for. Um, and then they respond by saying, we do not have the right to execute anyone. The Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. And so, you know, the Romans uh, were a part of the plan of God to crucify uh, Jesus Christ <clears throat> in this. So, now, you have that going on here. That's how we come to this conclusion. Now, look with me over in uh, Luke now, in Luke chapter 23. Let's look in Luke uh, Luke gives us another little sidelight here. What we're trying to do is draw a composite picture here of the trial of Jesus. Now look with me in uh, Luke. Again, this is the trial, but Luke records something the others do don't. Uh, down in verse 2, it says, And they began to accuse him. Now the him here is Jesus, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. Now, see, that's, that's why we, when you go back to uh, Luke, or rather Matthew 27, and Jesus, or Pilate, asked the question, are you king of the Jews? That's where this comes from uh, here. Uh, they made an accusation. Now, this accusation is a threefold accusation. Look with me in verse 2 now. Uh, they accused him what? Uh, we have found this man subverting our nation. All right, that's the first one. In other words, they were saying he's a rebel. Uh, he is a, a seditious person. Number two, second accusation, he refuses paying taxes to Caesar, uh, which was, of course, false. Uh, we all know, you remember Jesus, uh, huh? Huh? Yeah, it's an absolute, absolute lie. You're exactly right, Paul. You remember what Jesus says? Give to Caesar what? Yeah. All right. Render unto Caesar what's Caesar's, and unto God what's God. And he's not, he didn't say anything about not paying your taxes. And then the third thing here is, is that he uh, uh, claims to be uh, the Messiah. That the word Christ there is a word which means Messiah. Christ, a king. Well, that's partly true. He is king. You remember later on, uh, he says uh, to Pilate, uh, you know, my kingdom's not of this world. It is true I am a king, but my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, I could call out my followers, my disciples, and they would take up swords. And so uh, uh, really Pilate finds nothing in these charges against Jesus that are true, or at least would have a threat against Rome. Now, look at Jesus' answer. Go back now to Matthew, or to John with me again. Again, we're painting this composite picture here. John chapter 18. And look with me at verse 35 here. John 18, verse 35, what he says there. <clears throat> Back up to verse 34, really. Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? And Pilate says, am I a Jew? Uh, it was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place and so you see there's no there's nothing in this passage that really holds much water at all as far as the accusations made about Jesus now go back to Matthew this time and let's look as we look at this at verse 12 um, at what he says here in Matthew chapter 20 uh, 
7 here. Uh, it says down, if you look down at verse 18, it says, For he knew it was out of self-interest. Uh, your translation may say envy, because the Jews were envious of him, uh, that they had handed Jesus over to him. So Pilate knew uh, what was going on, and he knew for fact that they... Uh, uh, really didn't have any kind of charge against him. And so what does Pilate do? Well, Pilate comes back and he says, I find no charge. I don't find anything to accuse him of. And that's the verdict now. The phrase that he uses there, I find, is a legal phrase. Just like if you were uh, brought before court and you were tried, uh, and then the judge asked the jury to read the verdict, and the foreman would stand and say, we find the accused guilty or not guilty. So that's basically the same thing that Pilate's doing. Pilate says, I don't find anything to accuse him, and I find no fault, which is the verdict. Now go back to uh, Luke chapter 23 again. In Luke 23, at... Uh, and this time I want to look in Luke 23 at verse 5 with you. All right? <clears throat> All right, now, verse 4 here, back up to verse 4. Then Pilate announced to the chief priest and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Verdict. He's innocent. Verse 5, but they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. And so now they, they come back, and, and uh, he says, uh, you know, the verdict is he's not guilty. And, uh, and they come back, and they say, look, this man is a troublemaker. We know he's a troublemaker. Um, and, and his teaching goes all the way back to the time in, in Galilee. Now, that's the accusation. Now, I want you to see the second thing in this story, and that is the attitude of Jesus in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 12. It says he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, and he gave no answer. Now, again, that demonstrates his perfection. That demonstrates his innocence and uh and the fact that he was someone that they could find no real charge against. And so somebody says, well, why didn't he say something? Well, the verdict had already been made. Pilate had already said, I don't find any basis for a charge against him. What else was there to say? What else could he come back and, and reply with? There was really nothing else that needed to be said or that he would say to them. Now, look down at verse 14 here. But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the amazement of the governor. So he did not say anything at all. Why? Because he had said it all at the trial. He had said all that he had needed to say uh, before Pilate. Verse 13, then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the, uh, the testimonies they're bringing against you? And in the Greek there, it says not even a word. He did not say even a word uh, to them there. So Pilate now, he knows that Jesus is innocent, and he knows that the Jesus' silence here confirms the fact that his verdict was correct. He's right. You remember what Isaiah said in the book of Isaiah in the prophecy of the death of Christ? He's led like a lamb to the shearer, and anybody finish the rest of that? Do you remember what the rest of it says? Uh, he, he, he spoke not a word. He was dumb. That doesn't mean that he was stupid. It meant he didn't say anything, what it meant. And so that's a fulfillment of prophecy that, that's taking place here with uh, Jesus and his response and the attitude that he is having here in this. Now, here's something that you need to know in the background. It's not something you read in the text. It's not found in any of the Gospels. This is a historical record. Uh, 
Uh, Josephus writes about this. Others write about it. Ancient history. You can read this in ancient history. Pilate is on dangerous ground. He's on thin ice. Politically speaking, his job is in somewhat jeopardy. When Pilate took control and took power in 26 AD, uh, he decides that he's going to go to Rome, or rather to Jerusalem. And he is going to take his soldiers with him and as a display of power and authority to start out his, uh, his reign as governor of Jerusalem and Judea, he was going to have this display of power, which is a, probably a smart thing to do, I guess, to say, okay, folks, there's a new sheriff in town, and I'm the boss here, and, and everybody needs to know this. So, so what he does is he comes into Jerusalem, uh, with his parade of, of soldiers, and they're carrying their standards, they're carrying their flags, and on top of the flagpoles, the standards they have, is an emblem of an eagle. And on the eagle is the Caesar. Two big no-nos to the Jews. Uh, the Jews see these... Uh, standards and they see these emblems on top of these poles and right away they feel it's idolatry now look now this is what i'm going to talk about now is a part of you of, of biblical history you remember when the jews were taken off into captivity in the old testament and they were taken off into captivity for 70 years because they had been practicing idolatry that's why god destroyed judea and the temple under Nebuchadnezzar. After the 70 years, they are allowed to return and restore Israel and rebuild the temple. From that point on, from the time where they were restored back to Jerusalem, and you read about that in the books of Nebuchadnezzar, and, uh, or not Nebuchadnezzar, but the book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra, those books right there, you, that's where you read about this restoration. From that time forward, the Jews never again practiced idolatry. They fled idolatry like it was a plague uh, to the point where it became ridiculous. So when Rome now comes in, when Pilate comes in with this show of power and authority, and he has these Roman standards that have these emblems on them, the Jews riot. I mean, they, they riot. And so, but he refuses. Pilate, they asked Pilate to take those emblems off of the flagpoles. But he refused. And so what he does is he then goes back to Caesarea, which is where his headquarters is. Caesarea didn't have that kind of problem. He gets back to Caesarea, but the problem is the Jews follow him. <laughs> they follow him to Caesarea, and they continue their riot. So what Pilate does is, is that he rounds up all these Jews in Caesarea, and he puts them in the amphitheater, and he threatens to behead them if they don't stop rioting. And the Jews respond by pulling uh, their scarves down and exposing their bare necks and stretching their heads out, saying, go ahead. They call Pilate's bluff. Pilate knew that if he killed, slaughtered all these Jews, he'd have to answer to Caesar about this. Because Caesar says, the only thing I want you to do is keep the peace and collect the taxes. They win. They win the argument. Now, the second thing that happens is that he, uh, he decides that uh, during his... Uh, his uh, time as governor, that what he would do is that he would build an aqueduct uh, in Jerusalem because their water source was somewhat limited and risky, which is fine except for one problem. He funds it with money taken from the temple treasury. That didn't sit well with the Jews either. And they begin to ride again. So this time what happens is, is that a contingency of Jews 
leave Jerusalem and go to Rome and appeal to Caesar. And they tell Caesar what Pilate has done. Pilate sends word back and says to, or, or Caesar sends word back to Pilate and says, back off. He loses again. The third time, he goes to Jerusalem. He decides that he's going to build himself a, a residence there. And in doing that, he was going to uh, model this uh, residence or furnish this residence after Roman style. And so he had shields made for the Roman soldiers. And on the shields were the names, was the name Tiberius, who is the Caesar. Again, Jews claimed that to be idolatry. And they ride a third time. Pilate knows he cannot win this. So he backs off, takes the names off the shields. Pilate's on thin ice politically. He knows that. Uh, he knows the Jews have the upper hand on him in a lot of ways. See, Pilate was a great soldier. He was a horrible politician. <laughs> but the Jews were very good politicians. They knew how to play the system. They've done it a lot longer than he had. And so he's on dangerous ground when all this is taking place with Jesus. And so all that's cast into this as well as you look at this. Now, when Pilate hears the word, if you go back to now Luke chapter 23, look down at verse 7 here. It says, when he learned that Jesus was, was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who also was in Jerusalem at that time. He hears the word Galilee. Right away he thinks, oh, I've got an out here. I'm going to send him to Herod. Now, Herod here is a fellow we know as Herod Antipas. He's one of the three sons that Herod the Great had left his kingdom to. When Herod the Great died, the kingdom was divided into three sections. The northeast section, the middle section, and the southern section. The northeast section was very uh, much unpopulated. Uh, it was run by a fellow by the name of Philip, Herod Philip. The middle section, which is where Herod Antipas is, uh, is in Galilee. And that's where Jesus is well known. That's where Jesus did most of his ministry. Uh, and then the southern section was run by a son by the name of Archelaus. Archelaus didn't last all that long. He was so horrible that they ran him out of town after 10 years. That's how come they wound up with a Roman uh, governor uh, like Pilate. So <clears throat> Herod Antipas, what do you know about Herod Antipas? What's one thing that jumps out at you about Herod Antipas and his name? What was it that he did that you can think of? All right, that's right. He beheaded John the Baptist. So well, we know that much about him. He's very cruel. He's a very evil man. Um, he lives in the uh, town of Tiberias. And uh, what's interesting is, is that's in Galilee. Um, Jesus never goes to Tiberias. He never visits there. He stays out of there. I don't know why it could have been politically. It could have been because of Herod and uh, all that, and all that has to do with that. Uh, we don't know, but but he never went there. Um, but Herod knew about Jesus. He, he he had heard about Jesus. He was aware of Jesus, and so he he wanted to meet him. Look down at verse eight now in Luke twenty three. It says here now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. So he knew about him and he wanted to meet him um, for a different reason, but he wanted to meet him. Well, I've got to stop there. The red light's on and i got to quit. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>